Well, we do meet in propitious times, don't we, with uh, two elections and a major financial panic uh, all happening at the same time. Um, I have just recently purchased a house, which I thought was a particularly uh, savvy bit of timing. So if you're looking for me for, for any kind of financial advice, uh, uh, you can judge accordingly as to whether that should be part of your portfolio or not. Um, so I certainly can't pretend anything on that side of things, and I certainly won't be telling you anything about the insurance industry. Uh, but I've been asked to give you what little I can give you about the political scene, and I fear I may disappoint you on a couple of scores there. First of all, I am not going to tell you uh, who's going to win in any detail. I'm certainly not going to predict seat counts or anything like that. As I like to remind people, I am not in the forecasting business. I am in the finger-pointing, back-pointing, and re recrimination business. <laughs> it's what we do. It's what we cherish. It's what we know. And the other way in which I may disappoint you is that, and, and journalists, I'm afraid this, I'm violating the journalistic code here because we have a vested interest in significance. We find meaning in every passing cloud. Uh, we are always looking for turning points and defining moments. We just had the debates last night, and of course there is the traditional lament that goes up after every debate when we say there were no knockout blows, uh, which as my good friend Rick Salutin said, when journalists say there were no knockout blows, they mean there were no usable clips. Um, but, of course, there almost never is any knockout blows. The only knockout blow I can ever remember in any debate in history was Brian Mulroney lecturing John Turner on patronage, which, as we know, was a lie. He turned out to be even worse of a patronage king than Turner or, or Trudeau was. So let us not look for significance where it isn't there. And I suppose what I'm going to say to you is, um, if you're looking for what is the story of this election, what's the trend, what's the deep meaning, uh, I am coming more and more to the conclusion that there is uh, no story, uh, that this election was essentially baked in from the start. And as evidence for that, I might quote you the poll numbers. Uh, if you average out the polls from the first few days of the campaign, it looks like this, uh, 37 Tory, 26 Liberal, 18 NDP, and the Bloc and the, Quebec, uh, the, Bloc and the Green Party each getting nine. If you take the average of the polls up to yesterday, the numbers have dramatically shifted to 36 Tories, 25 Liberals, 19 NDP, 10 and 10. So everyone is within a percentage point of where they started. Um, there's been a lot of polls in between. There's been a lot of money expended by the media organizations on those polls. There's been a lot of hyperventilating instant analysis about each squiggle of the polls, and it hasn't amounted to a hill of beans. But behind that flat line, uh, there is a couple of stories. And I think I wanna, what I want to do is put this election in a larger context. And the two most dominant uh, trends I would identify are uh, the decline of the liberals uh, into irrelevance and the decline of the conservatives into incoherence. Uh, first of all, the liberals. Well, this election, I think, really should be bracketed with the last two, 2004, 2006, and may indeed be bracketed with the next one when the historians look back as a kind of a hinge moment uh, in Canadian history. And what we've been witnessing and what I think we were not properly aware of until lately was that the so-called natural governing party, the dominant party, the party that as recently as a couple of years ago people were writing books about, you know, the friendly dictatorship, the inevitability of, of liberal dominance, that there was in fact deep a structural weakness built into that party that I would argue uh, began really going back 50 years. Uh, it is forgotten that the liberals used to win majorities in this country with large representation from the West, where I'm from, uh, that they, they were a truly a national party once upon a time. Uh, that really ended in the West in 1958 with the Diefenbaker sweep, and they've really never fully recovered from that. They have not been in a, f a force in the West ever since. But that was okay because you could win, under Trudeau, 50, 60, 70, 75 seats in Quebec, the, the famous liberal power bastion of Quebec going back to Laurier in 1891. Well, that was destroyed by the Mulroney sweep in 84, and they've never really recovered since then, and in fact, in recent elections have fallen to historic lows in Quebec. But that was okay for a while because you could win 100 seats in Ontario 
Well, they're not going to do that anytime soon either. They've been operating, in other words, off of a narrower and narrower uh, regional base, one power ba base after another being knocked off. And they're now really essentially restricted to Montreal, Toronto. Vancouver was impregnable, but it's uh, breaking down. Parts of Atlantic Canada, but the NDP are starting to eat their lunch there. Uh, they are really essentially the Montreal-Toronto party for all intents and purposes. It, off, after the last election, you heard a lot of instant analysis about how there was a rural-urban uh, split, and that was what was the defining uh, split in Canadian politics, and not so. The, the Tories actually won most of the city centres in Canada, with the exception of the metropolitan centres. Those are the last bastions for the Liberals, and that really has not changed. So they have deep-seated structural problems that they've got to address, particularly their weakness in the West, where, as we all know, the money and the population and the power are shifting. And if they do not start to rebuild there, as they have shown no evidence of doing at this point, they're going to have a long and unhappy future. Um, uh, so if they think, likewise, that all their problems can be added up to, well, we made a mistake in choosing Dion as our leader, they've got another thing coming as well. There's reasons why Dion won, there's reasons why the other guys lost, and there's reasons why that party uh, needs to really give itself a shake and a real rebuilding process. But they, at least, in a sense, have the opportunity to do that, the opportunity that losing affords. The Tories, in a way, are in a deeper fix. They are prisoners of power. They are prisoners of their own success. And I say that with some regret, because once upon a time, they were a party that, while they lost elections, uh, actually stood for something. And that's not to be uh, dismissed lightly. The old Reform Party changed Canadian politics fundamentally. They were instrumental in building a consensus in favor of deficit reductions, for example. So the notion that you can't have an influence unless you're in power, that, uh, that, that standing for principles and convictions is for losers, I think is overstated. Now, in the process of trying to make themselves electable, I'm not going to say that everything they did was wrong. I'm not sorry that conservative parties are no longer uh, obsessed with bilingualism or the metric system or keeping the immigrants out or some of the worst ex you know, extremities of, uh, of right-wing politics. But it was a little sad when they were you know, no longer interested in uh, tax reform, in radical tax cuts of a kind that Ireland, for example, brought in, when they jettisoned any interest in reform of our bloated pension system, the Canada Pension Plan, or of the re reforming the in employment insurance plan, when they became entirely uninterested in spending cuts of any kind, when they abandoned their opposition to corporate bailouts and corporate welfare. But even that, I suppose you could justify in the name of incrementalism. Half a loaf is better than none. You can't have a revolution every day. The situation that they're faced at the federal system is very different than, let's say, the Harris conservatives faced in Ontario. I understand all those arguments, and I agree uh, that the conservatives had a, 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 a steep hill to climb, having been out of power for so long, particularly in Ontario, they really had to rehabilitate themselves in the public mind. But incrementalism is one thing. What the Harper government has actually been doing is hard to call even incrementalism. When you look at record, all-time record spending levels, of a kinds that any previous government could only have dreamed of, after inflation, after population growth. When you look at the GST cuts that might look like, t like a t sort of thing a tax cutter should favor, but have the effect of which has been to make significant personal and corporate income tax cuts uh, more or less unachievable for years to come. When you look at their sudden conversion to the cause of bailing out uh, auto companies, when you look at them banning foreign investment control, foreign takeovers, when you look at the complete abandonment of anything resembling democratic reform that the reform and alliance parties used to stand for, the absolute centralization of power in the prime minister's office, and the willing participation uh, by the Tory rank and file in this is the most distressing part of all. When you look in the middle of an election campaign, when the prime minister who had stood against artificial timetables and arbitrary deadlines for pulling out of Afghanistan uh, in public at a breakfast with reporters does a 180-degree backflip, uh, it really is impossible to say uh, what today's Conservative Party stands for. It is impossible to predict with any certainty what position they will take on any given issue. Uh, expediency has become the only watchword by which they are governed. 